my name is uh, Pedro Santa Clara, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third Atrium Nova uh, lecture in Macro and Finance. Uh, our speaker tonight is Franklin Allen, uh, uh, and he is the Nippon Life Professor of Finance and Professor of Economics at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his, his honors are almost too, too many to mention. Uh, he's been Vice Dean of the school, he was uh, executive editor of the Review of Financial Studies and is now the managing editor of the Review of Finance. Uh, he's been the, the president of the American Finance Association, the Western Finance Association, the Society for Financial Studies, which are only the three most prestigious uh, uh, academic uh, societies in finance, and is a fellow of the Econometric Society. Um, Franklin uh, received his doctorate from Oxford University, and he has uh, contributed extensively to corporate finance, asset pricing, uh, uh, financial innovation, <coughs> banking, financial institutions, uh, uh, and he is the main reference uh, on financial crisis. Uh, uh, finally, he's also a co-author with uh, Richard Brilly and Stu Myers of the textbook Principles of Corporate Finance, uh, from which I'm sure many of us first uh, uh, encountered finance. Uh, Franklin is going to lecture us to this evening on systemic risk in the European banking system, which is the topic for Europe uh, in the next few months. Uh, and so uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce you. Uh, I would just finally want to, to give a word of thanks to our sponsor, Atrium Investments, uh, in the person of João Fonseca, who is the CEO and a very distinguished uh, uh, alum from our MBA program. Franklin, thank you for coming. Please give us some hope. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pedro, for that very warm introduction. I'd like to thank Miguel and Pedro for inviting me here to give this lecture. It's always a great pleasure to come to Lisbon. It's one of my favorite uh, cities, and Portugal is one of my favorite countries. I'm going to talk about systemic risk. And I think the starting point is what happened? What, why did things go so, so drastically wrong in the uh, global financial system. We have all this banking regulation, why didn't it prevent the problems? And I think the, the first issue is that the idea on which it was based was if you control the risk each individual institution takes, then you control the risk in the financial system and we won't have any crises. And that turned out to be a dramatically incorrect idea because of systemic risk. So it's a different kind of risk, which is system-wide rather than associated with individual institutions. Now, one of the big issues, which I think we're still grappling with the dimensions of, is what exactly are the sources of systemic risk? Why do we have these financial system-wide breakdowns in finance. And I've divided it here into five categories. There are other ones which are missing, but this is a starting point for thinking about systemic risk. I'm going to talk first of all about panics, and I think that was the traditional way that macroeconomists thought about it. And I think there's still a strong tradition of crisis being panics. But what we've seen in this crisis, and in many other crises, as I'll argue, is that if you have major asset price falls, then banks get into trouble. And real estate is the big one, if you look back historically. Contagion is something that we have begun to think about a little bit. We'll talk about that somewhat. Financial architecture is an important aspect of the plumbing. And then, traditionally, I think foreign exchange mismatches, and particularly in the Asian crisis of 1997, was very important. One of the things I think the central banks did very well this time was to have swap facilities, which made that less of a problem than it's been in the past. 
Let me talk first of all about banking panics. So if everybody thinks the banking system is fine, then only the people who need money will take their money out and everything is fine. But the problem is if everybody thinks that things are in trouble, then they think other people are going to take their money out and so they also want to take out their money and we have a self-fulfilling panic. Now, one of the landmark books in economics from last century was this Friedman and Schwartz book from 1963. What they did was to go back and look at late 19th and early 20th century banking crises in the US and what they argued was that if you looked at the macroeconomic fundamentals, you'd find they were fairly constant up until the time of the crisis. And then when the crisis struck, you had a fall in real activity and the usual kinds of problems. And what they argued was their panics. And what we need to do as a policy is to get rid of them through things like deposit insurance. And a formal model that we have of that today is the Diamond and Dibvig model. And they have a very nice story how uh, if you have deposit insurance, then you eliminate the bad equilibrium. People don't need to take their money out because they know the government will step in and provide them with it. And what's even better is they never, the government never has to do that because the bad equilibrium goes away. Now, what we saw in this crisis was that that mindset is actually a problem rather than a benefit. First of all, deposit insurance is regard, I think by many, as consumer protection rather than crisis prevention. And we saw that that, in fact, was the case because what we saw was wholesale markets broke down and there were runs of those kinds. Also, large deposits are not covered and so on. Now, what's, what's the solution to the problem? If you think panics are important, well, should you guarantee all short-term debt or all debt even. Now, the interesting country there, of course, is Ireland, because I think many of the economists in the Treasury there were trained as macroeconomists and, and took the Friedman Schwartz view of the world, so that when, in September 2008, there was a problem and the bank started having run, their solution was, well, we should guarantee everything because it's just a confidence problem. We guarantee it, that'll solve it, and everything will be fine. But of course, it wasn't a confidence problem. There was an asset bubble, which was in the process of collapsing. Because they guaranteed the debt, the government then had an enormous fiscal problem, and that led to their bailout. We'll come back to some of those issues later on. Now, Ireland's a good example of what happened, but in fact, there are many reasons why the value of bank assets can fall. And here is a list, and we'll go through them one by one. And uh, again, it's, it's a partial list. There are many other things that can cause these problems. So let's, let's start with the business cycle. So, one of the interesting differences between the US and Europe is that views of government are very different. And this is a statement from John Quincy Adams, who was the author for a report on the Second Bank of the United States. So after the revolution, uh, um, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton became the Treasury Secretary. He had a strong belief in central banks like the Bank of England, and so we had the first bank of the United States. Then it was replaced by the second bank of the United States. And then in 1836, the charter of the second bank of the United States came up for renewal. And this was what he wrote, power for good is power for evil, even in the hands of omnipotence. Now, to me, coming from Europe, growing up in England, I think most Europeans think of governments as being something that are there to help people and do good things for people, whereas 
In the US, that's not the case. Governments are there, that they're necessary, but they're a necessary evil, and what you need to do is to restrict their power. And this is a good example of that, that if you give anybody enough power, then even if they're good intention, they'll end up using it for bad effects. And this is very much today even a theme in the financial sector. The notion is that central banks just have too much power and we need to restrict them. What happened was that the bill for rechartering got passed by Congress, but Andrew Jackson, who was a, a very much a hater of Wall Street and finance, he vetoed it, and they didn't have enough votes in Congress to overturn the veto. So between 1836 and 1913, there wasn't a central bank in the US. Now, as I said, Freeman Schwartz had gone back and looked, and they'd argued that these, uh, <coughs> these crises were the result of panics because of this uh, flat macroeconomic indicators. Now, my former colleague, uh, Gary Gordon, did some very important work where he showed that, in fact, you could predict crises. What he did was to look at the leading economic indicator of the liabilities of failed businesses. The idea is if businesses start going bankrupt with a lot of liabilities, that's going to get banks into trouble, and we're going to have a financial crisis. And what people, he argued, were doing was looking at that, and whenever it hit a certain threshold, so there were big liabilities that suggested the banks would be in trouble, then you got a financial crisis. That's a very powerful piece of work because it suggests that people are forward-looking and it's caused by fundamentals. It's not just a panic. It's people are trying to figure out what's happening to the liabilities that the banks are holding. And there was a debate in the um, late 80s, early 90s, of panics versus fundamental-driven crises during this period in the US. My own take on that literature and other subsequent <coughs> literature looking at other parts of the world is that, at least historically, both are important. We have to worry about both things. Now, what we saw in the recent crisis, of course, is that the, many of the countries that were heavily affected, the problem was real estate. And if you go back historically, and if you look at the current crisis, there's lots of evidence that real estate is arguably the major cause of problems in the financial system. You get credit booms, often that leads to price rises in real estate, and when the bubble bursts, then the banks get into trouble. It can happen in com commercial real estate. My colleagues Dick Herring and, and Susan Wagter look at the Asian crisis. In the Asian crisis, it was mostly com commercial real estate. But of course, in the current crisis, it's residential real estate. This is nothing new. This is a table from Reinhardt and Rogoff's a uh, very important book on history of financial crises. And what they do in this table is to document the relationship between real house pricing cycles and banking crises. So, for example, in Finland, they had a massive financial crisis in 1991. Uh, there was a downturn of six years. This is uh, the real activity. This is the magnitude of the decline in percent of real price, real estate prices. They fell about 50% in real terms in Finland. Japan, the interesting thing is, it's still ongoing. We're still many, many years and real estate is still going on. Now, maybe abenomics will change that, but it's been a long time. They fell, residential real estate prices fell about 40%. Norway, similar kind of late 80s as, as Finland, but 41 and a half, Spain, and Sweden. So these are massive <coughs> crises. These are the 1997 Asian crisis countries. Real estate played a big part there too. Uh, Hong Kong was the most heavily hit. They had a 60% real drop in 
real estate prices. It didn't lead, interestingly, to a banking crisis. And I think one of the very interesting examples is that case because the banks had such heavy capital that they were able to withstand these massive drops in real estate prices. You look at the other countries in the real estate prices fell dramatically there. Argentina, we had the um, default and crisis in 2001, they had about a 25% drop. Colombia in 98 had about a 50% drop. Now the historical episodes are few in their book because it's very difficult to get the data. Uh, the US, it didn't fall very much in the Great Depression, but if you look at some of the other data that they provide, which is things like building permits and so on, it actually played a big role in terms of the drop in economic activity in the Great Depression. One of the interesting ones, which I didn't know much about uh, until quite recently, was Norway in 1898. Now, they had a massive boom and then a uh, collapse in real estate of about a quarter in terms of prices. Now, the reason that I learned this was I was giving a presentation at the central bank in, in the Netherlands, and the vice governor of the Norge Bank, the Norwegian central bank, was there. And he, he was saying, yeah, there was a massive overbuilding in Norway for this crisis. And if you go to Oslo today, you'll notice that there actually there are no buildings between this about 1900 and 1925. They had a full quarter century where the real, real estate was so overbuilt they didn't need to build again. So these things have been happening for a long time. They cause lots of problems. And as I say, it's arguably the major cause. If you had to point to a single cause, it would be real estate booms and busts, I would say. Now, of course, if we look in a number of countries this time around, Ireland, Spain, and the US immediately come to mind. It's the major problem. What we've done here is to normalize prices in uh, 1996 at 100. And what you can see, the black line is Ireland, the red line is Spain, and the uh, pink line is the US. Ireland had a massive run up in real estate prices. Uh, it went up to almost 450, so um, at a 350% rise. Then it had a sharp drop, and that's of course what got the banks into trouble, and that caused the government to essentially go bankrupt and need a bailout. Now, Spain, a similar but not as extreme kind of run up, and interestingly, not as bigger fall. The US, not nearly as much. This is for the US as a whole, and we'll come to that in a minute. Now, a number of things to take away from these diagrams. The first is that there's positive serial correlation. Once real estate booms get going, they tend to continue. And once they collapse, the falls tend to continue. So they're very different from stock markets. Okay, we spent decades in financial economics documenting that prices adjust very quickly in stock markets and are essentially, to a first approximation, a random walk. That's not true in real estate. So my colleagues, uh, Joe Jerko and Ed Glazer from Harvard, have a paper for, which documents, for example, that if real estate prices in the US go up by a dollar this year, the subsequent year they go up on average 72 cents. So once you get going, then there's a high chance that they'll continue. And that is one of the problems with real estate because it means, if you, especially if you can borrow money, a particular large amount of it, a large proportion, it's a good thing to invest in because if it keeps on going up, then you're going to make a lot of money. If it doesn't, then it's somebody else's problem. Now, in Ireland, we saw this big drop. One of the interesting things in Spain is we haven't seen such a big drop. And of course, one of the big questions in Spain is, how much further are they going to drop? And the problem there is that there are a lot of construction companies and so on that are defaulted. And so the banks have a lot of property on their books. 
They know that if they sell all of that straight away, the price is going to fall, they're going to have to mark down their balance sheets, and then they're going to be in big trouble, even more than they are. So they aren't doing that. And this is the reason for the big uncertainty about exactly how much do the Spanish banks need in extra capital. Now, as I said, one of the interesting things is that in the US, if you look at the country as a whole, we don't seem to have had a problem. But what that masks is huge regional di diversity. And if you look at Los Angeles, for example, it's more than Spain, not quite as extreme as Ireland, but fairly extreme. If you look at San Diego, San Francisco, so California had big run-ups and busts. Other places like Nevada and so on, similar kind of thing. Not everywhere did, though. Places like New York and uh, Denver all didn't have much of a run-up. I live in Philadelphia. We had even less of a run-up and less of a bust. So this is one of the big puzzles. Why is it that some places have huge run-ups and others don't? After all, all these cities have the Federal Reserve setting interest rates. Mortgage rates don't really vary very much. And this is a puzzle. Supply is one reason. So the California cities, supply is quite constricted. But if you think about Nevada, there are no constraints. It's in the middle of the desert. And indeed, there are many housing developments out there in the desert with no one living in them, which are basically worthless. And the question is, why did people ever build there? Why did they think that would last? I think one of the reasons has to do with this issue that once you get booms going, then they become somewhat self-fulfilling and people start buying. Now, if we look in Europe, we've already talked about Ireland. This is uh, Spain again, the red line. One of the things that we talk about is those crazy bankers in Ireland and Spain and those crazy central bankers and regulators. Wasn't it obvious that this was going to be a problem? And I think one of the very interesting things about this, these graphs is, in fact, it, that isn't true because if you look at the country I grew up in, which is the UK, they had a big run-up, actually more than Spain slightly. At the onset of the crisis, they had a fall, but fairly quickly, prices in the UK, particularly in London, started going up again, and they're now above the peak. Another very interesting country is this purple line, which is Sweden. This is annual data. If you use monthly data, they did have a brief drop at the height of the crisis, but with annual data, it basically has gone, gone, gone up, and they're more now than about the same as Spain. So are those bankers in Sweden nuts, or what's going on? Well, Sweden has one of the best performing economies in the EU, and so the question is, is it a bubble, is it not? If you read the minutes of the central bank meetings, you'll find that argument played out. One argument is, well, if they're going up that much, it's, we're in trouble, there's a crisis just waiting to happen. The other view is, no, we have a strong economy, we haven't had a response in supply, it's just a shortage. This is Portugal, which is uh, the line, you haven't had much of a rise, and that's good news because you don't have much of a problem with real estate, at least. Uh, other problems, but not real estate. But one of the most interesting comparisons is between France, which is the green line, and Germany, which is the red line. France has had a big run-up in house prices. Germany hasn't. Recently, they have, because they've got a lot of money to, to lend out. But up until about 2011, German prices were pretty flat. But France's economy and Germany's economy are not that different. They both have fairly heavy manufacturing sectors. They both have interest rates in recent years, at least, set by the ECB. Why is it prices in France go up about 150%, uh, whereas in Germany they didn't go up? And I think what this underlines is 
that we don't really understand real estate pricing. And this is one of the big problems that central banks and regulators and investors face. We don't know why some countries boom and then bust, while other countries basically keep booming and there's no problem. And there have been studies on that. We don't know the answer to that. But given that real estate is so important in most countries for banks, this is a big issue. So, we need to think much more about that. Uh, I think in this particular case, low interest rates were to blame somewhat. I think particularly in the US when we went down to 1% in 2003 and kept it there for, for a year or so, it was a problem. The easy availability of, of credit because of the huge foreign exchange reserves of Asian central banks after the 1997 crisis is also a big factor which I think doesn't get enough uh, discussion in the literature. Now, one of the other big problems is that when we go into a financial crisis, I think we start to see financial markets malfunction in the following sense. When we teach basic finance or even sophisticated finance, we usually use arbitrage arguments that if prices get out of line, then there are incentives of people to buy and sell. And the problem is that in crisis, that doesn't seem to happen. So uh, a good example is mortgage-backed assets during the large crisis. What we saw was that real estate prices in the US started to fall in 2006, and then we began to get into the crisis in 2007. Now, the prices of these mortgage-backed securities started to fall quite heavily in late 2007. Many of the investment banks and hedge funds decided they were undervalued and they doubled their positions. Now, unfortunately, not enough people or not enough institutions did that and the prices kept going down and so they had to eventually sell out it a large loss. The, the, the classic example is Merrill Lynch selling at 22 cents on the dollar. Now those prices, both at the time, it was before the Lehman default, the real economy wasn't in trouble in most places, those prices seemed very low and subsequently we've seen them recover substantially. And I think that's a good example of limits to arbitrage. We talk about that in the theoretical literature, I don't think we have good theoretical, uh, sorry, good empirical studies of that, but I think it is a real problem. And that was a significant issue in the crisis because if you mark these things to market, it looked as though many of the banks were basically insolvent, but in fact I think it was actually the case that the prices were wrong rather than the, than the banks being insolvent. Of course, this was this argument, the Fed believed that, this was this argument that led to the idea for TARP programs, which was if the government goes in and buys undervalued assets, they can make a profit for taxpayers and solve the problem. In actual fact, it turned out very difficult to implement that idea, but I think the idea itself was probably correct because the prices of these securities did recover, and if you look at uh, the Fed has, has made a profit on most of those assets, at least of the mortgage-backed securities. It's a very controversial issue, but I think the pragmatic thing to do is to suspend mark to market if you think the markets are malfunctioning. If you look at most stock markets in the US, and if you look at many markets in Europe, a huge proportion today is high frequency trading. And I think we don't really understand how they operate, how they make their money. They claim they're providing liquidity, but whether it really matters whether you have a hundredth of a second or half a second for people to execute is, is an issue. My own view is that there's a lot of it is tr trying to front run, so they're trying to figure out who's breaking up trades, and if they see there's a lot of buy orders out there because they're getting hit, then uh, they try and front run. The other story is manipulation. They're going into the market, they stay there for a, a second or so, and they go on the other side, if you have a lot of people doing that, it's a lot like wash trades, which are a form of manipulation, which are banned very early on in stock market histories. May 6th, we had this massive meltdown in the US. 
fortunately occurred early in the afternoon, uh, and so by the within 20 minutes or so, the markets regained some kind of normality. But we had um, 20,000 trades, more than 300 security trades, at 60% away. And that was within a few minutes. If that had happened at five to four, just before the markets closed, and we'd priced everything using these prices, it would have been a big problem. And I think that's one of the big issues, is what should we do about high frequency trading? Sovereign default, of course, that's a big issue, and you're very familiar with that uh, in the Eurozone. I think it is a huge problem. I, we, we just, Pedro and I were just talking beforehand about, about this, but you know, the, the recent admission by the IMF that they didn't do things right for Greece is, I think, a very important one. I think they should have restructured, and they now uh, agree with that. And, you know, countries like Portugal and Spain and probably going forward Italy, the, the burden of paying back these enormous amounts of debt is, is clearly burdensome. But clearly there are a lot of politics involved and we see that in Germany. Taxpayers are very unwilling to see any kind of transfers and so we have these dynamics that don't work very well. There are many scenarios I've listed here, five. I think it's not quite clear to me exactly what the official scenario is at the moment, but as I understand it, there are going to be no more defaults. Everything's going to be paid back, and everything's going to be fine. Growth is going to return fairly soon, and we'll all be fine. A, a more likely scenario, in my view, is that we'll see more and more debt ending up on the balance sheets of the official sector. So we see that with the IMF, we see it with the EFSF and the ESM, and of course the ECB has also got already a fair amount, and if they ever implement outright monetary transaction, they'll have a lot more. And I think that that's fairly likely that it'll migrate there. And what you see in Greece at the moment is basically it's all to a large extent, not all, literally all, but a very high proportion is public sector debt now. And what they're doing is basically subsidizing the debt. They're getting very low interest rates in one way or, the, or another, either through um, liquidity funding at the ECB or the loan rates are now down at 1% or whatever. And that's essentially, if you compare it with what other countries like Ireland and Portugal are paying, it's much, much lower, and it's a subsidy. Now, whether that will be enough to get Greece through, we'll see. My own view is probably not. They're probably going to have to have some kind of formal public sector restructuring at some stage. But it, it may be that they manage to keep the debt on the public sector balance sheet at very low interest rates, and 20 years from now, when all the politicians are either retired or dead, who are there now, somebody will say, we should probably just write this stuff off. It's from a long time ago. Let's forget it. Now, the third option is what Greece did. And they had the private structure, sector restructuring. Yeah, it, I think it was too late if they'd done that at the beginning, and they'd had this 75% cut in NPV they probably would have been much better off. They would have maybe been growing rather than shrinking still now five years later, and it would have been much better. Uh, the ECB didn't want that. The official sector, the commission didn't want that. The IMF, as they argue now, said they did want it, but I think they were captured by uh, um, Strauss-Kahn and the other people. It was South Carmen was already running to be president of France, I think, and so they, they didn't put up as much fight as they would have done if, um, if the, system, the government system had been slightly different. But I think this is a good option. I think countries like Portugal and Spain and Italy, you're going to have a huge problem paying up back this debt, particularly as we'll talk about if interest rates start going up, which now looks as though it may start happening. My own view is that Cyprus, for example, should have taken the opportunity to leave the Eurozone 
they lost the Russian banking business and they're not competitive in tourism. Those are their two big industries. They're going to have a recession which is going to last even longer than Greece's and they're going to shrink a large amount. If they had left, they would have got the tourist business back again in large quantities and they would have done much better. Now, it's an interesting question whether Greece should leave or Spain, maybe Portugal, maybe Italy. We'll see. The Italian politics is playing out. We'll see what happens there. It looks as though uh, Beppe Grillo is a fading star at the moment, but Berlusconi may be on his way back, and he's very much a populist. And we'll see when they, we get the um, fiscal compact treaty kicking in in 2014, they're going to have to start paying their debt down by 3.5% a year. And that's going to be very difficult for them. It's going to require even more sacrifices and so on. If you leave the Eurozone, you regain monetary policy. You can have inflation to get down the debt. Now, there's lots of dislocation, but the country that <coughs> I quote as an example, which did well from this, is um, Argentina. They started growing very quickly again. They're now eight years later at GDP, which is twice what they were when they had the problems. We may also have an accident. We might have one of the big banks default or some other kind of accident, an election going wrong or something like that. Rise in interest rates, I think this is, this is the big systemic risk at the moment. Uh, we saw what happened when Chairman Bernanke mentioned that if the economy kept looking good, they might start reducing the quantitative easing. And that, of course, led to huge amounts of turbulence. And then the, in, the other really interesting one is China. What exactly happened in China? Why did interbank rates go to 28%? Well, my own view on this is we, they have a massively distorted economy. They have 3.4 trillion in foreign exchange reserves, in dollars and euros mainly. They're getting hardly any money on that. The way they finance that is by repressing their own financial system, by having very high reserve ratios for the banks and very low interest rates on deposits and government bonds. What's happening is that entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized enterprises and private corporations actually desperately need money but they can't get it because the state-owned banking system doesn't want to take any risk, so they just lend to state-owned enterprises. And so what we have is this shadow banking sector, which is not documented at all, where real interest rates are very high. And what we're seeing is people are trying to get money out of the formal banking system into this system. So the, the real problem is the real interest rate out there, at least in China, is quite high. And at some point, they're going to probably have to start reducing their foreign exchange reserves. And that's going to cause a big problem, particularly for the US, because they're funding our deficits. But if long-term rates start going up, we've already seen it. What just a few statements and a few tremors can do, then that's a big systemic risk. Because a lot of debt is held in long-term form. And this is, as I say, my view of what the main systemic risk facing us is. Contagion, this is very important. We don't understand it, contagion very well, but the traditional view is it's the domino effect. So if one bank goes down and other banks have claims on it, they may also go down and we can get this whole domino effect. What we also see is common asset exposures. If Lehman fails, investors who are not that knowledgeable look at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, and they say, well, they do similar kinds of things. They're probably in trouble too, and that's what we saw. We saw a run on those banks just after Lehman defaulted. I think if they hadn't got access to the deposit window by becoming commercial banks, they would also have had severe difficulties and may have failed. I think the big one, though, is if you look at what happened after Lehman defaulted and AIG had its problems, we saw the financial system and the real economy start to freeze up. World trade dropped and everything fell off a cliff. 
Now, the official sector was able to pull that back this time. Whether they could do that again if we saw anything like that, we'll see. I talked earlier about Hong Kong and how they went through this massive real estate crisis. I think that's a, a, the best argument there is for high bank capital requirements. Financial architecture. Um, there are a lot of problems with the financial plumbing. That didn't work well. We saw many things go wrong with that. And I, I won't go through the details. The official sector's been working on that. I think they've still got some way to go. For example, they've started to try and get derivatives, OTC derivatives, to move on to um, centralized exchanges. They made some progress, and we'll see uh, some things happen with that. But there are still a lot of problems out there. Foreign exchange mismatches. We saw, particularly in Europe, a lot of banks issuing deposits in foreign currency and then uh, having loans in foreign currency. So in Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe, that was quite common to get low interest rates. When the crisis struck, the deposits went away, but they still had the funding needs. And so what we saw was these very big mismatches the central bank stepped in and put in swap facilities, which actually worked very well. So um, that was a success story. And with the ECB, with the uh, Eurozone problems, they, they brought them back to, to help through. So the big question is, how has the official sector been doing? And how are they dealing with these systemic risks? Are they doing enough? Or is there still a lot of systemic risk out there in the system? So the Basel III, I think higher capital ratios are a good idea. I think they are necessary to try and uh, reduce systemic risk. And they've been implemented through CRD4. They've made some progress. They put in these buff, extra buffers, and effectively we're going to have much higher capital ratios around the world as a result. Whether they're high enough is an interesting question. The Swiss think they should be even higher, and I think for small countries with big banks like Switzerland and probably the Netherlands, this is a good idea to go significantly above these requirements. We have the liquidity ratios. I think it's an interesting question whether they're needed or not. In a financial crisis, my view is that's what the central bank is there for. They're there to provide liquidity. And so whether we need to have a costly liquidity ratio, which is a distortion, when you've got a central bank to step in and provide liquidity, I think is an interesting question, which we don't really understand very well at the moment. We see the activity <coughs> restrictions, so we have the Vickers report in the UK, in the, UK the Likener report in the EU, and in the US, of course, we had the, the Volcker report. I, I think my own view is we don't really know enough about whether activity restrictions are a good idea or a bad idea. The argument for them is that you might have a meltdown in one part of the bank, the proprietary trading which spills into the other parts of the <coughs> bank, the bankers argue, no, we need to diversify. It makes us more stable if we have diversified activities. I, I don't, the, these, these are not based on any kinds of careful studies. Their guess is, I think, of whether this is a good thing or not. Size restriction, we have the CIFI regulations. We'll see how those work uh, in practice. You know, it's an interesting question how much size makes a difference. My own view is it does make a difference, but that's because they have much more political power, they're much better at lobbying, and that's the real problem. It's not so much um, the size itself. And people talk about too big to fail, but there's no reason we couldn't liquidate these banks in actual fact. They, they can fail, we just don't want the contagion. We have to guarantee at least the short-term uh, securities. Bonus restrictions, uh, it, it, it's very interesting when you see how much attention gets on these bonus restrictions. And then you look at what these 
heads of banks make, which is, I guess, 10 to 20 million dollars, 30 million, something like that. And then when we look at what private equity managers make or hedge fund managers make, which are orders of magnitude bigger, and my own view is that this is just, they're, they're just not taking huge risks in the way that, 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 that people say they are. So I'm not sure how much they do. Um, when we've got what we're going through at the moment, we've had today's announcement about um, resolution frameworks and so on. Quite where all this will end up, we'll see. I think there's a lot of smoke and a lot of talk about it. My own guess is in the long run, not much will actually change because ultimately the Germans don't want to be on the hook for paying for legacy assets. They have some idea that if you have good resolution, then you can stop crises, but you know they don't control, regulators don't control long-term interest rates, for example. If long-term interest rates go up globally because of what's happening in China, because central banks get worried about inflation, regulators can't do anything about that. That interest rate risk is there in the banks. It's a big problem. <laughs> There are various other um, reforms that people have gone, that the government's going through. I'm not sure how much difference these make. Many of them are probably not a bad thing, but if we think about the sources of systemic risk, I'm not sure how much of those problems they address. So let me just finish up. I think the problems in the Eurozone are still there. Sovereign default is still very much a big problem. It is a systemic risk, and if interest rates do go up, it's going to get a bigger problem, and we'll see what happens. This is becoming a very real problem. I think it will continue. Capital is short in certain parts of the world. Interest rates have been low. They're historically low. What we've seen before is it's the turning point that's the big risk, and that's where we're at. Contagion, we've done something with capital requirements, but contagion is a big problem. You think of what happened post Lehman, that's a huge issue. I'm not sure we've done much to understand that, let alone address it. Real estate, uh, you know, one of the interesting things in the US is everybody's delighted that real estate prices have started to go up again, but it begs the question why is that? Is it another bubble? What exactly happened? Those are very uncomfortable questions for the official sector, and they don't think that people address those nearly enough. I think we still haven't grasped what to do if financial markets stop pricing assets properly, and that's a big issue. In the past crisis, I think if you look back historically, it's a major issue. Flash crashes are potentially a big problem uh, going forward. Again, I don't think we've done too much to address those. If you want to read some more about this, there are some references here. I think it's fine to post these slides on the, on the, on the website so you can read more about them. Um, we did a, a conference with the European University Institute on a couple of these things, and the, you can download these books for free. This was on sovereign default. And, uh, Last year we had one on governance in the Eurozone. This year we had one on banking union uh, and political and fiscal union. And there'll be another book like this that'll be there on the website. Thank you.